Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B, and uh, today we're going to address um, a, an important text, a uh, short story called A Devoted Son. We're with you on pages 14, 18, 14, 19. Anita Desai is, a, uh, is an important novelist for us. I want to point out really quickly that your literary analysis information is going to be important for this annotation. So you want to jot that down. Generational conflicts. What do we mean by generational conflicts? What does that term even mean? We're talking about what? Young people versus old farts, aren't we, right? That's basically what we're talking about, aren't we? That is to say, different generations have different understandings of what's right and what's wrong, what's expected and what's not expected. Notice also we're going to comment on static characters versus dynamic characters. You'll definitely want to make sure that's in your notes. And also those five words at the bottom of 1418. Now, real quickly here, let's talk through what this, uh, what this story is about so you've got some insight to it, all right? <clears throat> when we look at this story, we are going to look at uh, an, an ironic title. You want to write that down in 2B, Devoted Son, ironic title. In this, uh, in this story, we are set in India, and an Indian family will sacrifice everything to send their boy away to medical school. Okay? The father of the young man, obviously very proud of his son's success and devotion, until the son begins to tell his aging father what he can and cannot do. And in that moment, as the father's decline, health decline, the young man is going to begin to give him certain kinds of orders that the older man just cannot appreciate at all. We'll look at a little bit of background on 1420. Since India won its independence from Britain in 47, modernism has resulted in dramatic contrast between old and new. You've got a great picture on 1421 to kind of show you that, huh? Two different modes of transportation, obviously. <clears throat> Anita decides, dramatizes the conflict between the traditional respect shown parents, symbolized in the custom of touching one's father's feet, and the modern education that parents strive for their children to acquire. In other words, as children get older and smarter, how sometimes do they relate so well to their parents? This will be an interesting story on that count. We'll do a close reading now. Just follow along, pay attention. Here we go. The Devoted Son by Anita Desai. When the returns appeared in the morning papers, Raki scanned them barefoot and in his pajamas at the garden gate, then went up the steps to the veranda where his father sat sipping his morning tea and bowed down to touch his feet. The first division son, his father asked, beaming, reaching for the papers. At the top of the list, Papa, Rakesh murmured as if forward, first in the country. Bedlam broke loose then. The family whooped and danced. The whole day long, visitors streamed into the small yellow house at the end of the road to congratulate the parents of this wounded king, to slap Rakesh on the back and fill the house and garden with the sounds and colors of a festival. There were garlands and halwa, party clothes and gifts, enough fountain pens to last years, even a watch or two. Nerves and temper and joy, all in a multicolored world of pride and great shining vistas, newly opened. Ratish was the first son in the family to receive an education. So much had been sacrificed in order to send him to school and then medical college. And at last the fruits of their sacrifice had arrived, golden and glorious. To everyone who came to him to say, Mubarak, Varmaji, your son has brought you glory. The father said, yes, and do you know what is the first thing he did when he saw the results this morning? He came and touched my feet. He bowed down and touched my feet. This moved many of the women in the crowd so much that they were seen to raise the ends of their saris and dab at their tears, while the men reached out for the beet leaves and sweet meats that were offered around on trays and shook their heads in wonder and approval of such exemplary filial behavior. 
One does not often see such behavior in sons or more, they all agreed, a little endlessly for that. Leaving the house, some of the women said, sniffing, at least on such an occasion, they might have served pure key sweets. And some of the men said, don't you think old Varma was giving himself airs? We needn't think we don't remember that he came from the vegetable market himself. His father used to sell vegetables, and he's never seen the inside of the school. But there was more envy than rancor in their voices, and it was, of course, inevitable. Not every son in that shabby little colony at the edge of the city was destined to shine as Rakesh shone. And who knew that better than the parents themselves? And that was only the beginning, the first step in a great sweeping ascent to the radiant face <coughs> of fame and fortune. The thesis he wrote for his MD brought Rakesh still greater glory, if only in select medical circles. He won a scholarship. He went to the USA. That was what his father learned to call it and taught the whole family to say, not America, which was what the ignorant neighbors called it, but with a grand familiarity, the USA, where he pursued his career in the most prestigious of all hospitals, and one in common from his American colleagues, which were relayed to his admiring and glowing family. What was more, he came back. He actually returned to that small yellow house in the once new but increasingly shabby colony right at the end of the road where the rubbish vans tipped out their stinking contents for pigs to nose in and rag pickers to build their shacks on, all steaming and smoking, just outside the new wire fences and well-tended gardens. To this, Rakesh returned, and the first thing he did on entering the house was to slip out of the embraces of his sisters and brothers and bow down and touch his father's feet. As for his mother, she gloated chiefly over the strange fact that he had not married in America, he had not brought home a foreign wife, as all her neighbors had warned her he would. For wasn't that what all Indian boys went abroad for? Instead he agreed, almost without argument, to marry a girl she had picked out for him in her own village, the daughter of a childhood friend, a plump and uneducated girl it was true, but so old-fashioned, so placid, so complacent, that she slipped into the household and settled in like a charm, seemingly too lazy and too good-natured to even try and make Rakesh leave home and set up independently, as any other girl might have done. What was more, she was pretty, really pretty, in a plump pudding way that only gave way to fat, soft spreading fat like warm wax after the birth of their first baby a son, and then what did it matter? For some years, Rakesh worked in the city hospital, quickly rising to the top of the administrative organization, and was made a director before he left to set up his own clinic. He took his parents in his car, a new sky blue ambassador with a rear window full of stickers and charms revolving on strings to see the clinic when it was built and the large signboard over the door on which his name was printed in letters of red with a row of degrees and qualifications to follow it like so many little black slaves of the region. Thereafter his fame seemed to grow just a little dimmer or maybe it was only that everyone in town had grown accustomed to it at last. But it was also the beginning of his fortune, for he now became known not only as the best, but
but also the richest doctor in town. However, all this was not accomplished in the wink of an eye. Naturally not. It was the achievement of a lifetime, and it took up Rakesh's whole life. At the time he set up his clinic, his father had grown into an old man and retired from his post as the kerosene dealer's depot, at which he had worked for 40 years. And his mother died soon after, giving up the ghost with a sigh that sounded positively happy, for it was her own son who ministered to her in her last illness, and who sat pressing her feet at the last moment, such a son as few women had born. For it could be admitted, and the most unsuccessful and most rancorous of neighbors eventually did so, that Rakesh was not only a devoted son and a miraculously good-natured man, who contrived somehow to obey his parents and humor his wife and show concern equally for his children and his patients, but there was actually a brain inside his beautifully polished and formed body of good manners and kind nature, and in between ministering to his family and playing host to many friends and coaxing them all into feeling happy and grateful and content, he had actually trained his hands as well and emerged an excellent doctor, a really fine surgeon. How one man, and a man born to illiterate parents, his father having worked for a kerosene dealer, and his mother having spent her life in a kitchen, had achieved, combined, and conducted such a medley of virtues no one could fathom, but all acknowledged his talent and skill. It was a strange fact, however, that talent and skill, if displayed for too long, ceased to dazzle. It came to pass that the most admiring of all eyes eventually came and no longer gazed at his glory. Having retired from work and having lost his wife, the old father very quickly went to pieces, as they say. He developed so many complaints and fell in so frequently and with such mysterious diseases that even his son could no longer make out when it was something of significance and when it was merely a peevish whim. He sat huddled on his twin bed most of the day and developed an exasperating habit of stretching out suddenly and lying absolutely still, allowing the whole family to fly around him in a flat, wailing and weeping, and then suddenly sitting up, stiff and gaunt, and spitting out a big gob of beetle juice as if to mock their behavior. He did this once too often. There had been a big party in the house, a birthday party for the youngest son, and the celebrations had to be suddenly hushed, covered up and hustled out of the way. When the daughter-in-law discovered, or thought she discovered, that the old man stretched out from end to end of his straight bed, had lost his pulse. The party broke up, dissolved, he turned into a band of mourners when the old man sat up, and the distraught daughter-in-law received a gob of red spittle right on the hem of her ganza sari. After that, no one much cared if he sat up cross-legged on his bed, poking and spitting, or lay down flat and turned grey as a corpse. Except, of course, for that girl amongst them, his son Rakesh. It was Rakesh who brought him his morning tea, not in one of the china cups from which the rest of the family drank, but in the old man's favourite brass tumbler and sat at the edge of his bed, comfortable and relaxed, with the string of his pajamas dangling out from under his fine lawn nightshirt, and discussed, or rather, read out the morning news to his father. It made no difference to him that his father made no response, apart from spitting. 
Okay, so follow it. You've got a kid, a gun. He has an intellectual academic gun. The bright star of his family becomes a doctor. Everybody's happy with him. Everybody's proud of him. Dad starts to suffer from certain kinds of maybe fake illnesses, what we call hypochondria. He wants his son's attention. And guess what? He's getting it, but pretty soon he's going to get a different level of attention. What is it going to be like? 3B question. What is it going to be like when you finally have to look at your old man or your mom or whoever's raised you in the eye and say, I love you, but I need your car keys. You're not doing it anymore. No more. You cannot do it anymore. You're going to kill yourself. You can kill somebody else. You want to go somewhere, you call me, I'll drive you somewhere. No more. Give me the keys. Try to imagine what that will be like and what kind of argument will come back from those people. Do you honestly think those people who have raised you are going to say, oh, sure, honey, great. So now I don't get to go anywhere without somebody taking me somewhere. The people you grew up with, are those, are those people capable of saying that? Or are they more going to incline to say, wait, 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 I raised you. I took care of you. Now you're, you're supposed to take care of me and you're doing this. Why are you being so mean to me? Watch how this watch. Watch how this works. This is a fascinating moment in our story. Right? Everybody go to it. It was Rakesh too, who on returning from the clinic in the evening, persuaded the old man to come out of his room, as bare and desolate as a cell, and take the evening air out in the garden beautifully arranging the pillows and posters on the divan in the corner of the open veranda. On summer nights, he saw to it that the servants carried out the old man's bed onto the lawn and himself helped his father down the steps and onto the bed, soothing him and settling him down for a night under the stars. All this was very gratifying for the old man. What was not so gratifying was that he even undertook to supervise his father's diet. One day when the father was really sick, having ordered his daughter-in-law to make him a dish of suji halwa and eaten it with a saucer full of cream, Rakesh marched into the room, not with his usual respectful step, but with the confident and rather contemptuous stride of the famous doctor and declared, No more halwa for you, Papa. We must be sensible at your age. If you must have something sweet, Veena will cook you a little kheer. That's light, just a little rice and milk. But nothing fried, nothing rich. We can't have this happening again. The old man who had been lying stretched out on his bed Weak and feeble after a day's illness, gave a start at the very sound, the tone of these words. He opened his eyes. Rather, they fell open with shock, and he stared at his son with disbelief that darkened quickly to reproach. A son who actually refused his father the food he craved? No, it was unheard of. It was incredible. But Rakesh had turned his back to him and was cleaning up the litter of bottles and packets on the medicine shelf and did not notice while Veena slipped silently out of the room with a little smirk that only the old man saw and hated. Halva was only the first item to be crossed off the old man's diet. One delicacy after the other went. Everything fried to begin with, then everything sweet, and eventually everything, everything that the old man enjoyed. The meals that arrived for him on the shining stainless steel tray twice a day were frugal to say the least. Dried bread, boiled lentils, boiled vegetables, and if there were a bit of chicken or fish, that was boiled too. If he called for another helping, in a cracked voice that quavered theatrically, Rakesh himself would come to the door, gaze at him sadly and shake his head, saying, Now, Papa, we must be careful. We can't risk another illness, you know. And although the daughter-in-law kept tactfully out of the way, 
the old man could just see her smirk sliding merrily through the air. He tried to bribe his grandchildren into buying him sweets, and how he missed his wife now, the generous, indulgent, and illiterate cook, whispering, here's fifty passy, as he stuffed the coins into a tight, hot fist, run down to the shop at the crossroads and buy me thirty pesce worth of jalebis, and you can spend the remaining twenty pesce on yourself, eh? Understand? Will you do that? He got away with it once or twice, but then was found out. The conspirator was scolded by his father and smacked by his mother, and Rakesh came storming into the room, almost tearing his hair as he shouted through compressed lips, Now, Papa, are you trying to turn my little son into a liar? Quite apart from spoiling your own stomach, you're spoiling him as well. You're encouraging him to lie to his own parents. You should have heard the lies he told his mother when she saw him bringing back those jalebis wrapped up in filthy newspaper. I don't allow anyone in my house to buy sweets in the bazaar, Papa. Surely you know that. There's cholera in the city, typhoid, gastroenteritis. I see these cases daily in the hospital. How can I allow my own family to run such risks? The old man sighed and lay down in the corpse position. But that worried no one any longer. There was only one pleasure left to the old man now. His son's early morning visits and readings from the newspaper could no longer be called that. And those were visits from elderly neighbors. These were not frequent, as his contemporaries were mostly as decrepit and helpless as he, and few could walk the length of the road to visit him anymore. Old Bhatia next door, however, who was still spry enough to refuse adamantly to bathe in the tiled bathroom indoors, and to insist on carrying out his brass mug and towel in all seasons and usually at impossible hours into the yard and bathe noisily under the garden tap, would look over the hedge to see Varma were out on his veranda and would call to him and talk while he wrapped his dhoti about him and dried the sparse hair on his head, shivering with enjoyable exaggeration. Of course, these conversations rolled across the hedge by two rather deaf old men, conscious of having the entire households overhearing them, were not very satisfactory. But Bhatia occasionally came out of his yard, walked down the bit of road, and came in at Varna's gate to collapse onto the stone plinth built under the temple tree. If Rakesh was at home, he would help his father down the steps into the garden and arrange him on his night bed under the tree and leave the two old men to chew beetle leaves and discuss the ills of the individual bodies with combined passion. At least you have a doctor in the house to look after you, sighed Bhatia, having vividly described his martyrdom to bias. Look after me, cried Brahma, his voice cracking like an ancient clay jar. He, he does not even give me enough to eat. What, said Bhatia, the white hairs in his ears twitching. Doesn't give you enough to eat, your own son? My own son. If I ask him for one more piece of bread, he says, no, Papa. I weighed out the atta myself, and I can't allow you to have more than 200 grams of cereal a day. He weighs the food he gives me, Padia. He has scales to weigh it on. That is what it has come to. Never, murmured Padia in disbelief. Is it possible, even in this evil age, for a son to refuse his father food? Let me tell you, Varma whispered eagerly. Today the family was having fried fish. I could smell it. I called to my daughter-in-law to bring me a piece. She came to the door 
and said, no. Said, no. It was Bhatia's voice that cracked, and Drongo shot out of the tree and sped away. No. No, she said, no. Rakesh has ordered her to give me nothing fried. No butter, he says. No oil. No butter, no oil. How does he expect his father to live? Oh, Varma nodded with melancholy triumph. That is how he treats me. After I brought him up, given him an education, made him a great doctor. Great doctor. This is the way great doctors treat their fathers, Bhatia. For the son's sterling personality and character now underwent a curious sea change. Outwardly, all might be the same, but the interpretation had altered. His masterly efficiency was nothing but cold heartlessness. His authority was only tyranny in this time. There was cold comfort in complaining to neighbors, and on such a miserable diet, Brahma found himself slipping, weakening, and soon becoming a genuinely sick man. Powders and pills and mixtures were not only brought in when dealing with a crisis, like an upset stomach, but became a regular part of his diet. Became his diet, complained Varma, supplanting the natural foods he craved. There were pills to regulate his bowel movements, pills to bring down his blood pressure, pills to deal with his arthritis, right. and eventually the pills to get low, right? beating. In between, there were panicky rushes to the hospital, some humiliating experience with a stomach pump and enema, which left him frightened and helpless. He cried easily, shriveling up on his bed. But if he complained of a pain or even a vague, great fear in the night, Rakesh would simply open another bottle of pills and force him to take one. <laughs> I have my duty to you, Papa, he said when his father begged to be let off. Let me be, Varma begged, turning his face away from the pills on the outstretched hand. Let me die. It would be better. I do not want to live only to eat your medicines. Papa, be reasonable. I leave that to you, the father cried with sudden spirit. Leave me alone. Let me die now. I cannot live like this. Lying all day on his pillows, fed every few hours by his daughter in law's own hand, visited by every member of his family daily, and then he says he does not want to live like this. Rakesh was heard to say, laughing to someone outside the door. Deprived of food, screamed the old man on the bed. His wishes ignored, taunted by his daughter in law, laughed at by his grandchildren. That is how I live. But he was very old and weak, and all anyone heard was an incoherent croak, some expressive grunts and cries of genuine pain. Only once when old Bhatia had come to see him, and they sat together under the temple tree, they heard him cry, God is calling me, and they won't let me go. The quantities of vitamins and tonics he was made to take were not altogether useless. They kept him alive and even gave him a kind of strength that made him hang on long after he ceased to wish to hang on. It was as though he was straining at a rope, trying to break it, and it would not break. It was still strong. He only hurt himself, crying. In the evening that summer, the servants would come to his cell, grip his bed, one at each end, and carry it out to the veranda, there setting it down with a thump that jarred every tooth in his head. In answer to his agonized complaints, they sent the doctor south and told them he must take the evening air, and the evening air they would make him take, thump. Then Veena, that smiling hypocritical pudding in a rustling sari, would appear and pile up the pillows under his head till he was propped up stiffly into a sitting position that made his head swim.
swing and his back is. Let me lie down, he begged. I can't sit up anymore. Try, Papa. Rakesh said you can if you try, she said, and drifted away to the other end of the veranda where her transistor radio vibrated to the lovesick tunes from the cinema that she listened to all day. So there he sat, like some stiff corpse, right. terrified, gazing out on the lawn where his grandsons played cricket, in danger of getting one of their hard-spun balls in his eye. And at the gate that opened onto the dusty and rubbish heaped lane, but still bore proudly a newly touched up signboard that bore his son's name and qualifications, his own name having vanished from the gate long ago. At last the sky blue ambassador arrived. The cricket game broke up in haste. The car drove in smartly and the doctor, the great doctor, all in white, stepped out. Someone ran up to take his bag from him, others to escort him up the steps. Will you have tea, his wife called, turning down the transistor set, or a Coca-Cola? Shall I fry you some samosas? But he did not reply, or even glance in her direction. Ever a devoted son, he went first to the corner where his father sat gazing, stricken, at some undefined spot in the dusty yellow air that swam before him. He did not turn his head to look at his son, but he stopped gobbling air with his uncontrolled lips and set his jaw as hard as a sick and very old man could set it. Papa, his son said tenderly, sitting down on the edge of the bed and reaching out to press his feet. Old Parma tucked his feet under him, out of the way, and continued to gaze stubbornly into the yellow air of the summer evening. Papa, I'm home. Verma's hand jerked suddenly in a sharp, derisive movement, but he did not speak. How are you feeling, Papa? Then Verma turned and looked at his son. His face was so out of control and all in pieces that the multitude of expressions that crossed it could not make up a whole and convey to the famous man exactly what his father thought of him, his skill, his art. I'm dying, he croaked. Let me die, I tell you. Papa, you're joking, his son smiled at him lovingly. I brought you a new tonic to make you feel better. You must take it. It'll make you feel stronger again. Here it is. Promise me you'll take it regularly, Papa. Varma's mouth worked as hard as though he still had a gob of beetle in it. His supply of beetle had been cut off years ago. Then he spat out some words as sharp and bitter as poison into his son's face. Keep your tonic. I want none. I want none. I won't take any more of your medicines. None. Never. And he swept the bottle out of his son's hand with a wave of his own, suddenly grand, suddenly effective. His son jumped <coughs> and the bottle was smashed and thick brown syrup had splashed up, staining his white trousers. His wife let out a cry and came running. All around the old man was hubbub once again, noise, attention. He gave one push to the pillows at his back and dislodged them so he could sink down on his back, quite flat again. He closed his eyes and pointed his chin at the ceiling like some dire prophet, <coughs> groaning, God is calling me, now let me go. What do you make, write it in your notes real quickly, what do you make of the, of the breaking of the bottle at the end of the story? It is a symbol of what, do you think? The son gives the dad one more medicinal protocol, and the dad does what with the bottle? I'm done. What does it mean to you? What's symbolic about that? What would you say is symbolic about the fact that the old man is break, breaks the bottle? You, you see at his resignation, has he given up? 
He's quit. Right? What does this story say about relationships between children and parents? Of course, what's missing in this story, think about it, is that at some point, our young son is going to grow up himself to be an old man, and then guess what? Right? The circle's going to continue. Somebody's going to give him a bottle when he's really old and wants to be done, right? And he isn't going to want it, even though he himself is a doctor. Hmm. But an interesting story about what we will call that generational gap, right, between the young and the old. All right, guys, there you go, Devoted Son, an introduction.